We looked at a, what we might call a masterpiece and not known that the artist thought that it actually fell short of his or her goals. And because of that, they had the propulsion to move forward more often than we could know. Think of a painter who I love, Paul Cezanne. He didn't sign 90% of his paintings because he didn't feel they met his goal to, as he put it, realize nature in paint. It helped him complete the 10% he did sign. And in large part, it's why we have the large body of works we do by Paul Cezanne. Think of the novelist William Faulkner. When he published The Sound and the Fury, it went on to its acclaim, but he wasn't satisfied with it. He rewrote sections of that book five different times and published it as an appendix to the novel's later editions. In a sense, mastery has inbuilt a sense of the incomplete, sort of best summarized by a quote that is a short prayer Michelangelo stated. He said, Lord, grant that I desire more than I can accomplish. And this is what mastery is about. It's about caring about that near win. So I was going to tell you all about that. I was going to talk about the gift of the deliberate amateur. Masters know that ultimately to see a problem anew, you need to eventually give up your expertise to retain the curiosity of the child the wonder of the child, and I'll speak more about that today. I was going to also talk about the power of grit, the ability to withstand failure feedback over not just years, but decades, as Angela Duckworth has shown us in her now MacArthur winning work. She's a psychologist based at the University of Pennsylvania who's explored this idea. I went to her because I wanted to understand for creative folks how grit turns not into dysfunctional persistence, which it can be if you pursue a goal that doesn't get you anywhere, uh, but a more nimble trait that can help us over time. I was thinking about someone like a Samuel Morse who invented the telegraph, as we know, but spent 26 years prior to that in the failed pursuit of being a painter. He converted the stretcher bars of one of his paintings into the telegraph itself the failed foundations of one endeavor as the foundation of what President Obama said to Michael Lewis one day when he's being interviewed for a Vanity Fair article is the start of the internet. And it is. Samuel Morse is the first tech entrepreneur, you might say. But he does show us this nimble quality of grit, the ability to change your kind of lower level tactics to still meet a higher level goal. In his case, it was invention. But I decided that I couldn't just speak about the tactics to create something new for the world without giving more airtime to what I'm not often permitted to discuss uh, when I'm invited to conferences, because they want me to speak about all of that. And it is what the stakes are for not speaking about what is lost when we don't honor the force of anything creative in our lives. And what I'm getting at, really, is the power of wonder. I do what I do as a curator and an author and critic at, at Yale and now at Harvard as a voice fellow, not so much because I want to honor the individual pursuit or even genius of an individual's work, but because of the power of aesthetic force, you might say, in us. How do the arts move us? How does anything move us? And why is it so important? The theme of pop tech, rebellion, made me want to speak about this. This country came to understand the power of wonder and the power of the arts during one of our most extreme times of revolution and rebellion. You know what I'm talking about, the Civil War. During this period, one man wanted to emphasize for this country what's lost when we don't